as many of you were probably whispering in your mind as she was playing that last song, Come Holy Spirit. That's what we are about this morning, that God may reveal himself through his spirit to us, through the things that we say, the things that we do within our gathered community here. And one of the ways that we enter into that holy place, that holy, holy space, that holy time, is by calming our hearts. And so our prelude this morning will hopefully get us into a position to where we are ready and uh, willing to receive the Lord today. Good morning. Welcome to Heights Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you are here worshiping with us in, uh, in the pews, present with us today, and those of you that are online. We hope that you discover new ways to understand God and how to live out the call that he has upon your life as you gather with us uh, this morning. I was approached by somebody within our congregation that wanted to lead a song this morning and it was some sort of victory song, a team that he was in favor of uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, or I think a Minnesota, I can't remember what it is. It was Bruce Creel. Uh, Minnesota, that's it. Because I, I heard that they won some important game recently. Uh, but I said, maybe after we have our worship service this morning, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll do that. But we've got our own songs to sing this morning uh, because we desire that the Lord is with you. That is something that we pray for regularly, and it's something that is words that we speak over our gathered community and those that are, of course, online visiting with us. We ask that the Lord be with you. We call ourselves to worship and away from the world by focusing ourselves through a litany that enables us to say the purposes that we are gathered here is to lift God up and to enable him to lift us up in the week ahead. And we do that with our responsive call to reading. My words are in yellow and yours are in white. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Be the wind and the fire that transform our lives. Kindle faith from our believing doubt. Let us from our 
deepen our passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fill your church with power. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And let us stand and rejoice and join our voices together. opportunities that we have to celebrate within the life of our family of faith and for since the Jesus was with us in his ministry we have celebrated the receiving of individuals into our family of faith through baptism Jesus before he went off and began doing his ministry in the world he went to the Jordan and was baptized by his cousin and uh, he was giving us an example of how we can be obedient to God's call upon our life. And it was a sign of devotion. Now, as the church throughout the ages has celebrated baptism, the uh, baptism has played a little bit different role depending upon what generation we've been in. In many churches in the olden days, the uh, baptismal font was right at the entrance so we would be emphasizing the fact that it is initiation into the Christian community. Uh, other churches have it up in the area right underneath the cross to help us to understand the reality that it is a public profession of the salvation, the forgiveness of sins that comes to us through Christ our Lord. And what we do is we celebrate it both in those, uh, uh, both of those veins, that it is initiation into the body of Christ. It is a response, a public profession of salvation in Christ that the individual has taken upon themselves. And Sarah has uh, become an important part of our family of faith by singing in the choir and by joining her, 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 it, us in ministry with her hands and with her voice. 
and she has professed Christ as her Savior. And so this is a public confession. This is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace that she has received of herself to where the forgiveness that Christ offers she has received and in fact lives in now. It doesn't mean when we go for, through baptism that we're going to be perfect, but it means that we are going to try to do our best to live up to the call of Christ and open ourselves up to the power of His Holy Spirit so that we are able to get to the righteousness someday that He already deems us when we receive Him as our Savior. And so there are questions that we ask of um, any individual that comes forward that are able to answer for themselves. Uh, and these questions are, do you have Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Yes. Do you intend to be Christ's faithful disciple from here on? Yes. Okay. Now, the water itself, and if you want to reach in there and touch it, it's warm, so it won't surprise you. <laughs> Usually when we baptize little children, I make sure it's warm. That way they don't cry. I don't imagine that Sarah will cry if she, if she has some over her head. But uh, we, we let us bow our heads so that we may pray for this event. Heavenly Father, we know that you work mightily through the life that, that is in submission to you. And this is one step of so many say where Sarah will, will, will be a follower of yours, a disciple of, of yours. There are times of victory that she will encounter and there will be times of failure. But Lord, what this baptism symbolizes is that victory is always hers even if failure does come. And so we rejoice in that. We ask, Lord, that this water would not be just normal water out of a spigot, but would be water of regeneration so that she may come under the healing powers of your water of regeneration, the living water of Christ. So we ask that you would bless her, that you would bless us here, and that you would bless this water for those purposes. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, just go ahead and lean over. Sarah Minnick, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go live as a disciple of Christ, your Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now there, there is a question that I ask of you as members receiving her as a part of your spiritual family. Do you, the people of God, members of Christ Church, promise to share with Sarah the good news of the gospel and the ways that you live, to surround her with love, to surround her with compassion, and to support her through prayer, through fellowship, and giving her direction whenever the Spirit moves you? So cool. Would you stand with us, please? I found a friend, oh such a friend, he made my heart his own. God himself is with me and I know I'm never alone. I know all my tomorrows will be better than all my hopes. we got love, grace, peace and power and joy in the Holy Ghost. we got love. Power over. 
hearts filled up with joy. The Holy Spirit filled me up, and I need Him every day. For by faith, confidence, and knowing what to say, you gave my heart and all I am to the one who loves me most. We got love, grace. Let us become 
Now comes the time in our worship service where we actually request the Holy Spirit to work within our lives. For Scripture tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that calls, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts, it is the Holy Spirit that enables us to pray to God with a broken heart so that that heart may be made whole once again. And the beginning of that journey is one of confession where we confess to God and we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us in the silence of our hearts those areas where we have been less than godly, where we have been more selfish than we needed to be, where we have chosen to be rebellious, where we have sinned. And so this is our call to confession this morning. We do not stop enough to listen to the God who speaks to us, and like the people of Jerusalem long ago, we often misunderstand the Spirit's movement among us. In the silence and the stillness of this moment, let us draw near to God and listen. In silence, we may be brought to an awareness of what it is that we need to turn from, to let go of, or be released from. So let us go to our God silently and confess our sins together. Spirit of God, you come to us as a powerful wind, but we have shut the door and bolted it to try to keep you out. You descend on us as tongues of fire, but we run away afraid of being consumed. You give us gifts beyond our ability, but we squander them, we hide them, we say, not today, or how can one person even make a difference? Or, no Lord, not me. God, forgive our feebleness. Break open the doors of our resistance. Let the fire of your spirit work within each of us and give us courage and faith to claim your call for our lives. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. amen. Hear the good news. God's spirit has been poured out upon all flesh and we have been made one. We are no longer scattered or divided, but gathered together to build up the kingdom on this earth. And that deserves thanks. So thanks be to God.
God is good all the time. us up. Amen. <laughs> we love you, Father. You are wonderful. In Jesus' name, and they all said, amen. amen. Would you share the love of our Lord Jesus? Okay, as you guys make your way back to uh, your pew, I was corrected. Uh, it actually is Michigan that we were supposed to begin the worship service off with, but we won't do a victory song for Michigan. Let's do one for Massachusetts. <laughs> but Matt uh, is another M word, is going to come up and share a thank you for uh, what we've recently done. Good morning, church. 
On behalf of the diaconate, I would like to say thanks to you and lead you in praises to God for the 71 boxes of food that you donated to the Tinian Baptist Church on Christmas Eve. They received 71 boxes. They had so much left over that there was a funeral shortly after Christmas, a sad occasion, but people did not leave empty-handed. Tinian was able to share food with them. Some of them who don't regularly come to church were blessed by your donation. And they had so much more left over that they even shared with a smaller, more remote church than they are. So the blessings have flowed down. Thank you for your generosity. We do desire to understand that you've been here worshiping with us this morning. And so the brown pads that are next to the aisle at the end of the pew, go ahead and grab those, put your name in. If there are any prayer requests that you have that the elders do pray for uh, and our power prayer people, then go ahead and write that on the far right side. Once you have completed your line, pass it on to your neighbor and uh, let them tell us that they've been worshiping with us and what we may pray for them. And then when you get to the end of the aisle, go ahead and pass it back. That way you learn who all is in the pew worshiping with you uh, this morning. Also, if you're visiting with us for the very first time, in uh, the back of the pew, in the pew pocket, there's a little card. If you desire to be in contact with us or want us to be in contact with you uh, in the coming weeks, just go ahead and fill that card out and put it in the offering plate or the offering bag when one of them comes by. And uh, we will reach out and uh, see how we may serve you uh, this week. Uh, this Sunday, of course, this last week, I don't know if you've been noticing in the news, they've had a march down in Santa Fe, and then they also had a gathering that was in Washington, D.C., because we're celebrating the value of life this, uh, this entire week, and this is actually Sanctity of Life Sunday, uh, and that's something that we rejoice in, and that's something that we pray for. Uh, we've been praying over the whole year, uh, all 12 months. It's not just one of those things that we need to be concerned with for a moment, but it's one of those things that we need to pray over and, and ask that God would move within us and within our society as a whole to, uh, uh, to see that every one of us is valuable, especially those that are not able to speak for themselves. Now comes the time where we have the elected elders uh, to be ordained and installed as they come forward. Now, before I hear any complaints, realize these are individuals that you all elected. Okay, now, I don't, think, I don't expect to, to hear any complaints. There's nothing but rejoicing in this family. So if we will have uh, Adam White, Karen Tweedy, Mike White, and Steve Herman come forward, we will ordain them and install them this morning. And in next week, we will have our deacons ordained and installed and then the week after that we will uh do a big thank you for the elders that cycled off at the end of 2023 now when persons are elected by you all you are saying that you are willing to submit to their spiritual authority over us as a body of christ but also uh, that you are willing to speak to them if you have a concern over something that is occurring within our family of faith. And that's, what, that's a part of what their role is, is to help guide and direct us and help give us an example of what it means to live a life that is reflective of the grace of Christ. And we believe and have elected them because we believe that they are able to do that because they've already done that in our midst for years. But there are questions that we ask them before they're fully brought in. Now, Steve Herman has been an elder before, and so he's already ordained as an elder. And so the questions that we ask uh, all of them, only the last two are the ones that he needs to answer. So if you notice that he doesn't answer the first three, it's not because he objects to those questions. <laughs> it's just that he's already answered those questions, okay? So I'll ask you all, and I hope that this is affirmative uh, from all of you. Do you believe the scripture of the Old and the New Testament to be in the inspired word of God, the authority for faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church as containing the essential doctrines taught in the Holy Scriptures? That's what this thing is right here. Do you approve of and promise to uphold the government of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church? You're going to be a part of it, so I sure hope so, yes. 
Do you promise to promote the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church? Okay, now this, is, this comes where you come in, Steve. Uh, in participating as an elder in the judicatories of the church, do you promise to share in a responsible way in the decisions that are made to abide by those decisions and to promote the welfare of the church? Do you accept the office of elder in this church and promise faithfully to discharge all the duties thereof as God may enable you? Okay. Now, what, how we do this is we do this by laying on of hands. That's how we pray uh, for God to ordain them for the task that he has called them and to fulfill them. And so Jerry's coming up and he's going to put his hands on those two. So, Heavenly Father, again, we give you thanks for calling out from among us those that can lead by example, those that can provide us wisdom when we are wandering about, and for those that are open to your wisdom when decisions need to be made as to the ministries of this church and its role within the society in which you have placed us. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint each of these elders that you would fill them with your spirit so that they may lead, so that they may guide, so that they may listen, so that they may speak all in accordance with your purposes. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Now I believe uh, I have a question also of you. Do you, the members of the church, acknowledge and receive these elders and do you promise to give them such encouragement and support and respect as belongs to the office that they will occupy. Okay, congratulations. Now that we have uh, received our leadership for 2024, and for two years beyond that they will serve, let us prepare our hearts to receive the word of God with the singing of our doxology. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for joining all of your children together so that we can worship you. Lord, continue your work in us. Continue to stir us in areas that we need to improve. Continue to help us be strong in areas that you have already given us a strong foundation in. Lord, we pray for Pastor Jerry that he might speak your word and your word might take root in our hearts. Lord, um, just help us to be examples of you every day this week and as we continue forward. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not know these things? I tell you the truth. 
We speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. No, thank you very much. Well, we've been looking at the Holy Trinity. We've talked about God the Father, talked about God the Son, and today we're going to be looking at God the Holy Spirit. Some of you may have heard me mention this or speak about it before. I never really knew much about the Holy Spirit growing up as a kid. I was raised in a small town in the Texas Panhandle. My parents were Baptists. 
which meant I went to Baptist church every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, and every Wednesday night. And as long as I can remember going to those churches back then, and there was two that we went to on occasion, I never heard anybody in the Baptist church speak about the Holy Spirit. And that's the God's honest truth. And in all the years that I have been alive, I have never heard anybody preach any sermons on the Holy Trinity. And that's just for me. I don't know. Maybe you have, okay? Baptists at our church didn't mention him much. What they did mention most of the times was Jesus. And then they had a sermon about Jesus. Then they would have an altar call with just as I am. And it would keep going and going until at least somebody came down to accept Jesus that day. <laughs> Oftentimes, I would scoot down just so the service would end. I never really paid too much attention to the Holy Spirit in my life. Not until my wife's covenant group came over to my house one night and turned my life upside down. Some of you may have heard this story, but I'm going to share it very quickly. As I said earlier, as a young child, I've been in church most of my life. That was until I got out of high school and went into the service because of the Vietnam War. Didn't go to church much in the service. When I got out of the service and got married, moved back here to Albuquerque, started working as an electrician, every Saturday and Sunday, I was playing golf. Every Saturday and Sunday. I didn't have much time for golf, as most people did, but I made a point to go play. I didn't have much time for church either. But my wife was a regular church attender. And for a while there, she had tried to get me to come to church, and I would come. She belonged to what's known as the covenant group, which some of you belong to. Well, one night I had gone down to the church here with her, and she had talked me into going to a particular thing on an on a evening down here. And I listened to it, and uh, we went back home. She said, it's okay if they come over for coffee and cake and ice cream and all that good stuff. I said, dear, I don't mind. But you have to understand, I have to be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. No problem. They came to my house. They did not leave my house till 12.30 at night. <laughs> There was one man who I did not know who talked to the group that night and he kept talking about the Holy Spirit. And what he really talked about more than anything else was the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So maybe you may remember him. His name was Carl Foster. I didn't know him from Adam. And Carl Foster is my spiritual brother today even to this very moment. Well, I went to bed that night after everybody left, and I'm sitting there thinking about one of the things that he really said, more importantly, that just got my mind. He said, don't you dare ask God what it is he wants you to do in your life unless you really want to know, because he said, most of you won't do it. And I went to bed that night, and I could not get that out of my mind. So I got up and I went out into my living room. My wife was asleep. I went out there and I said, God, it's been a long time since we talked. And I'll tell you what, God just loves dumb prayers. I said, God, it's been a long time since we talked. I said, you know, these people are at my house tonight have the same kind of problems I do in life and they're happy about it and I ain't. And I said, but that thing that that guy said, don't dare ask you what it is he wants you to do in your life unless you really want to know. I said, God, I always thought it was okay to be an electrician. I said, is there something else that you wanted me to do? And my friends, that's when I found out who the Holy Spirit was. He crashed on my life that night 
I spent the whole night bawling, tears rolling out of my eyes. I went to work the next morning, tears running out of my eyes. It's like nobody even saw me. I walked back behind the trailer where all the tools and everything were. And I'm thinking, gee whiz, what's going on? And I heard a voice. And the voice said, look at the mountain. A what? Look at the mountain. And I looked up at the Sandia Mountain and I saw three crosses sitting up there. And I rubbed my eyes and I said, my gosh, what is going on? Somebody's put a hex on me or something. <laughs> and I, I tried to walk away and I still crying and everything. And I said, what is going on? I heard the voice again, look at the mountain. Look at the mountain. And I looked at the mountain, and this time I saw one cross. And I heard these words as God is my witness standing here today. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, thou art a prophet of the Lord. And I said, that's it, I'm out of here. <laughs> I was going home, and I ended up at the house of the guy that said all that stuff the night before, and I had no idea where in the world he even lived. I knocked on this door that I didn't know where the person lived. She opened the door, his wife, and she just hollered, Carl! Carl came in and invited me into his house, and he tried to explain to me everything about the Holy Spirit, about the gifts. And he said, let's go down to the church, and let's see Larry Moss, and let's pray together. We can find out what it is God wants you to do. We went down here, and of course, you know, no preacher's ever at church. We went in the old gym over there because that was the only sanctuary we had at that time. And we prayed that I would find out what God would want me to do in my life. And I'll guarantee you, when we walked off that platform over there in the gym, I knew what God wanted me to do. And within a month, within a month or two, I was packing my stuff up and my family and moving to Tennessee to go to school and to go to seminary, and to become a pastor. Why did I pick that scripture today to read? Because, my friends, so many people in this world today are ignorant of the Holy Spirit. They are just like Nicodemus. When Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a ruler, you're a teacher of all these things, and you don't know this, I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. But I will tell you this. I believe today that he is the most misunderstood, the most feared, the most unnecessary, and the most mysterious part of the Godhead called the Trinity. He is a person, my friend, of the Trinity. He is a he. He is not an it. You can find him in the Old Testament where he had an office there. You can find him in the New Testament and he had an office in there as well. And yet he is undeniably the most least understood of the Godhead. In the Old Testament, in Numbers 11, verse 25, the Spirit rested upon them and they prophesied, which meant that he came to men came to women as well. Not as a person, but he came with someone. He came alongside someone. He came upon them, okay? And throughout the whole book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, you will find literally page after page after page after page of God's references in his word of saying that I will be putting my spirit upon you. That was prophecy. In Joel, the second chapter, verse 28 and verse 29, let me read. And it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young and old men will dream visions, and young men will see visions. And even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, prophecy by Joel, and it happened, and it came in Acts, the second chapter, 
You know, it's hard to say what the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit. He has no physical appearance. No physical appearance whatsoever, except as a symbol. And that symbol is either like a dove, or he is like a wind, a loud wind, a rushing wind. My friends, the Holy Spirit is God. He is God. Second Corinthians 3, 17, John 4th chapter, verse 24, will show you that he is God. Genesis, in the first chapter, verse 1, verse 2, he was there in the very beginning with God the Son and with God the Father. Christ himself accomplished things through the Spirit. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 14, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, you can read all of those. The seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which Jesus proclaimed. And yet in those letters that to each one of those seven churches, he said this, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You can go to Asia Minor. You can see where those churches were. Did they listen? Not hardly. I think today... God is still saying through his Holy Spirit, Spirit, listen to what this God is saying to the church today. So let him who has an ear hear. Again, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, he was active as written by the Old Testament writers. Time and time again, the Old Testament tells us about the Spirit of the Lord. Lyle's learning me how to do this in messages. I love it when you do that. It gets the point across. Time and time again, the Old Testament tells us that the Spirit of the Lord was upon men moving them to act. Some of them were judges for Israel. Like you'll see in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. You remember David, King David, even before, or even while he was, when David sinned with Bathsheba at the death of Uriah? What was it that David cried out? David said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit is known by many, many names. He's known as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth. He's known as the Comforter, and he's also known as the Helper. So remember, any time in your Christian life that you have an issue, that you have a problem, that you don't know how to deal with it, there is someone who is your Helper. Many times when we've had memorial services here at this church and people sitting there on the front row, they will understand that the Spirit is the Comforter to them at that time, as he would be for you as well. In the Old Testament, the word for spirit is known as rosh, meaning wind or breath that is exhaled, exhaled very forcibly or is blown. That's found 389 times in the Old Testament, that word rosh. In the New Testament, the word for spirit is mostly used by the term Pneuma. It's where we get the word pneumatic, air driven. It also means wind or breath or forcefully blown. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus that night? He said, Nicodemus, you feel that wind on your face? That's how the Spirit is. The Spirit blows where He goes, He blows where He wants to, and He goes where He wants to. You can go outside here today and you can feel the wind blowing on your face. You might tell where it's coming from, but can you tell me where the wind is going? You can't. You just say, well, it's blowing east. We're blowing New Mexico into Texas. That's how Texas got big. (laughs) I'm from Texas. But in the New Testament, that word pneuma is found 378 times. 
is preceded by the word holy. Holy Spirit, 89 times. The Bible tells us that he is the one who gives spiritual gifts to his children. Do you realize, my friend, that as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit has sealed you and that he has given you gifts? Do you know what your gift is? The Holy Spirit has attributes of mind, will, and feelings. He has attributes of mind, will, and feelings, just like you. His will is that he gives gifts as he sees fit. His mind is that he is very intellectual. He is very intelligent. His feelings, the Bible tells us, is that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that's most notable about the Holy Spirit is that he indwells in you as a believer of Jesus Christ. That ought to got an amen. amen. About time. <laughs> John 14, let me read John 14 for you, please. John 14, 14th chapter, verses 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. And that is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides in with you and will be in you. All three of the persons of the Trinity are in those two verses. I, that is the Son speaking. I will ask the Father, that is God the Father. It is the Father who sends. And then he says, I will send a helper. That is the Holy Spirit. In that one verse, all three of the Godhead are mentioned in that one verse. Nowhere in the Bible does it mention ever the Trinity. But we believe in it, do we not? My brothers and sisters, do you not realize that as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit dwells in you? The Holy Spirit is in you? If you accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, Jesus says the Holy Spirit abides in you and is in you. I feel very compelled to say this this morning as a warning. You may dress like a Christian and go to church. You may come to church like a Christian and sit here you may go to church every Sunday morning. You may read the Bible and quote it forwards and backwards. But that does not mean that you're a Christian. So it was with Nicodemus that night. If there is no indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have no part in the family of God. I'll say that again. If you do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you and in you, you will have no part in the family of God. So you may ask me, how do I know that the Holy Spirit's in me? Well, let me ask you a question. 
Do you know if you're alive this morning? Or not? Are you alive this morning or not? Do you breathe this morning? Do you see this morning? Do you smell this morning? Do you walk this morning? Does your body move this morning? Can you see all of these things around you this morning? Is there any thought in your mind this morning? If so, then you know you're alive. So it is, my friends, with the Holy Spirit. Do you feel guilt or remorse when you sin? Think about that. Do you feel remorse or guilt when you commit a sin? Do you today have a desire to follow God and to be righteous, to be Christ-like? Do you desire today to learn about God even more and practice his word that he's given to us? Do you today talk with God and does he talk with you? Can you hear his voice today through the Spirit speaking to you? John 10 Verses 27 through 28. Jesus says, My sheep, my sheep will hear my voice. And I know them and they will follow me. And I give eternal life to them that they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Can you hear that? Do you hear that promise? As I mentioned earlier, I used to be an electrician. Anybody in here ever been shocked by electricity? You know what it felt like, right? Okay. I know what it felt like, trust me. And so will you. So if God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within me and dwells within you, I have something to say this morning that I hope will have a whole big meaning to you. This Holy Spirit that's resting in my heart, resting in my body, making my body a temple. Do you think you and I would know that? Do you think you would know if he's really there? Have we come to realize Have we really come to realize that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, that that Holy Spirit indwells us? As the Father said, I am who I am. Jesus said, I am. I'm going to say something. I can't prove it, but I believe it. I wholeheartedly believe today that I am is in you. The great I am is in you by the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that God is in you this morning? I stated earlier that most of us have misunderstood the Godhead of the Trinity. A church without the Holy Spirit in it is like a ship without a sail. And as Lyle told me the other day, it's like a car without gasoline. The Holy Spirit is the power of the church. The Holy Spirit should be the voice of the church. And I think today the church needs the leadership of the Holy Spirit more than ever. More than ever. I think it's time across this United States in which we live for God's church again, a God's church again, to seek that leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because man's leadership has cost us way too much already. Look at your denomination that you came from. Making decisions on theirs and not God's. And as a Christian, 
Do not let the world's obstacles along your way to eternity shake your confidence in God's promise. And God's promise to you is this, that the Holy Spirit is in you. And he will seal that until the day you arrive in heaven. William Barclay once said, the simple fact in the world today is the fact that the world is too busy to give the Holy Spirit a chance. How busy are you? Can you give him a chance in your life today? We don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit, my friends. He's been here the whole morning. He's been here the whole morning. He came at Pentecost and he has never left the church since. It's the people. It's the people who have left. Not God. Marty texted me this morning. He said, preach it, brother. How'd I do, Marty? Amen. Amen. I cannot tell you how the Holy Spirit has affected my life. I know what gifts he's given me. I try to use them. But I will tell you this. When I said that God told me, he said, you're a prophet, I said, that's it. I do not claim to be a prophet, my friends. Marty's smiling. Because Marty's always asking me about that. But I will tell you this. The church today really needs the leading of the Holy Spirit. You need it in your life every single day when you get up. You thank God that he sent his spirit to this world. You thank Jesus that he sent a comforter and a helper every day of your life that you're here. So I'm going to end by saying this. Church, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of God has said this morning and said to you. Amen and amen. amen. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Holy Spirit of God, I ask this morning that you would continue to abide with us I ask, O oh God, the Holy Spirit, that you would continue to inspire all of our thoughts, inspire all of our actions, pervade our own imaginations, suggest that all of our decisions, order all of our decisions, be with us in silence, O oh God, be with us in our speech as we speak each day. Holy Spirit, be with us in our haste. Be with us in our times of leisure. Be with us in solitude. And in the beginning of each day and at the end of each night when we weary and need rest. And above all, O Holy Spirit, give us the grace at all times to humbly rejoice in your presence, in our lives, and forevermore. Amen and amen. It's time now for our offering this morning. Our offertory prayer is on the screen. In the coming of your Son, O God, we have received the spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and prayer and power of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Use all that we say and do and use these gifts we offer now to be instruments of your peace here upon this earth. Amen.
you stand, please, we have our closing hymn. since I'm a former Baptist, I'm going to do this. My friends, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come down after we have our benediction. If you're not sure the Holy Spirit dwells within you, I would ask that you come down and receive the Holy Spirit in your life. And with that being said, here's our benediction this morning. As the Spirit has transformed you into the likeness of the Son, go now, letting the life of Christ guide you each moment of the day. Go now in love, with grace, and in the light of Jesus, and empowered by His Spirit. Amen and amen. Oh, let us go forth now in the name of Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs>